Are you an adventurer looking to take your hunt to the next level? Then you're in the right place. Welcome to East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. Hey everyone, welcome back. And if you're just joining us for the first time, welcome. Thanks for checking out the podcast. Hopefully you find some good information here. So I wanted to start out with an announcement here that I'm going to start releasing these episodes on Tuesday now instead of Monday, mostly for the reason that I'm traveling just about every weekend throughout the summer here, and I'm sure that's going to carry into the fall. So I just wanted to have an extra day to be able to to get everything put together I edit the podcast ahead of time, but as far as like doing the introductions like I'm doing now, I like to do it the day before that I actually release the episodes so that that whatever relevant information is going on for that time period, I can make sure that I get that in there. So so that's what I'm going to do for the time the this time frame at least and we'll see how that works and and kind of go from there always evolving and changing this past weekend and actually into last week i was at the total archery challenge in seven springs for the four-day event this is my second year having a booth there last year when i first went there it was before i even had released an episode of this podcast i was just starting to record there brand new no one ever heard of the podcast nothing it was a, it was crazy to, you know, go there. I'm every person that came up. I'm explaining, you know, what's, what my goals were for it and what I want the podcast to become. And this year was a little bit different. There was a lot of people that still, you know, that I was, you know, educating on, you know, what I was trying to do with East meets West and everything else. But there was also a lot of you that I got to meet that are already listeners and that was super cool to to hear your feedback you know good and bad everything it was awesome to get to to meet those people and and that's what i love about the total archery challenge if if you want to go to a place where you can walk up to just about anybody there and have a conversation that may last hours about you know just just straight up like like-minded people that event is by far my favorite to go to every year and I didn't even shoot it this year I said that uh, probably in the last episode that I wasn't going to actually shoot because of trying to be disciplined in and breaking the whole target panic uh, well, well, to be dramatic I'll call it epidemic that I'm going through here and so I, I didn't even get to shoot it which shooting the courses is absolutely amazing but just getting to hang out with all the people from rob chalinski who's the one who puts on this event and sean de gray who owns it and and all the vendors the awesome companies and reps that they have there and you know most importantly all the people that are there that you know pay to go shoot and make this event happen every year that support it it was it was so cool and on saturday I hosted uh, the first East meets West adventure hike, which having a hike at 630 in the morning after a uh, backcountry hunters and anglers pint night the night before is kind of a risky thing. I wasn't sure kind of what the turnout was going to be like, but I was absolutely blown away. There was, I think it was 45, maybe 46 people that signed in and showed up to the event to the hike and we hiked all the way up to the top of the the ski hill and then down back and around it was about a 1.1.6 mile hike and the the hike was pretty good we had you know great weather for it luckily it was some rain all throughout the the rest of the event there but we had good weather for it just such a great group of people that took part in it luckily you know i had literally like a week to put everything together um 
I was so pumped when Rob gave me the green light to do it and just reached out to some partners to, to be able to see if they would be interested in donating any giveaways to give to everyone that showed up. And it was unbelievable the support that, that I got to give away stuff. Sick of Gear gave away somewhere around 15 hats to everyone, some subalpine ascent hats. And Onyx Hunt gave away a bunch of memberships. There was, um, who else? There was Mountain Ops, just they gave away a bunch of tubs of Ignite, some of their new bottles, hats. And then I threw in some donations for hats and shirts. It was just like, it was unbelievable that every single person walked away from there with things. And that there was just such a variety of people and, you know, men and women that just took part in that. And I was, I, I was ecstatic at the, the turnout for that. So if you're one of the ones that came, thank you for that really truly enjoyed it and talking with everyone so hopefully we'll make this an annual thing now there and and keep the the adventure hike going and with that the hike to hunt challenge has just kicked off with backcountry hunters and anglers it's a way to raise money to in support of public lands and in addition to that be able to get yourself in shape and make it kind of fun and, and challenge yourself to, to raise money. And, and if you don't want to, to put upfront money as far as to join the actual challenge where you can win a bunch of prizes and everything, you don't have to, you can still log miles and show support that way through the BHA hike to hunt. They use an app, uh, Under Armour's app called map the hike and that app is built specifically for BHA, but you can find all the information on that at backcountryhunters.org, which is Backcountry and Hunters and Anglers website. They have all the information there. Go check that out and definitely take part in that as it just kicked off here on June 1st for the challenge. So take a look at that. And so without, without any more information here, let's get into the partners here, the podcast. So the University of Elk Hunting and Corey Jacobson have put together the most comprehensive elk hunting course available right now. This course goes through just about everything from the planning phases, calling, fitness, gear, everything. As as you've heard on the last podcast that I did with Corey, I've talked about it before. I mean, this, this course has everything that you need to plan your first elk hunt or if it's your 10th elk hunt, it doesn't matter. It's got that information in there for you. So if you want to check out that course, Corey's doing a giant giveaway right now that has to do with you can win a truck that's all decked out and everything else with a partnership with Mountain Ops. If you sign up, use the code East Meets West for 20% off that course. That'll save you $20 on the annual membership. In addition to that, Heather's Choice is also a partner of mine in the podcast. And Heather has come out with the highest quality food products available for the backcountry hunter, hikers, adventurers, travelers, whatever that may be. She has put put together these food options that are great tasting and nutritious, gluten-free, dairy-free, the whole bit. And you can check that out. And if you use code East Meets West, you'll get free shipping on orders over $99. Or if you click on the logo on the partners page of our website, if it's under $99, that'll just help show that the support of the podcast as well. Check that out at heatherschoice.com. And lastly, Maven Optics. So Maven has built the highest quality optics through their direct-to-consumer business model. They're able to do that at half the price of their competitors. And their no-fault lifetime warranty is kind of standard now in the industry, to be honest. But what makes them stand out is their customer service. If you call right now with any issues, I can promise you 
Molly is going to pick up the phone and she's going to help you out. She's a a great person. So you're talking to a real person that's going to help you with that. It's not a giant corporation. They don't want to be. They want to keep close correlation and engagement with their customers. So if you decide that you want to check out Maven Optics and purchase one of their products, any full price optics order, if you enter in the code East Meets West dash gift, get yourself a free gift with that order. And you can check that out at mavenbuilt.com. All right. So let's get into this podcast here with Corey Anderson, who's an MMA fighter, a UFC top 10 light heavyweight contender, and also a great hunter who's aspiring to do some more and show his his lifestyle as a hunter as well. So Rob Chalinski from Total Archery Challenge just so happened to be the one who introduced me to Corey, and uh, we definitely hit it off here. So check this out, and if you like it, give a rating and review on iTunes or wherever you listen to the podcast. Thank you. All right, welcome back. Another episode of the East Meets West Hunt Podcast. Tonight, I have on the line, coming from, I believe, New Jersey, Corey Anderson. What's going on, man? What's going on, Bo? Yeah, I'm coming from New Jersey. Where are you at, New Jersey, Corey? Um, Right now, I'm in Jackson, New Jersey. You know, it's uh, right next to Great, Great America. It's the central location between Philly and New York. You know, so when it comes to training, it's easiest to be here in the central area because it's the commuter state. So it's a lot of driving back and forth. So, yeah, yeah, it's definitely a, a busy state. That's for sure. And uh, you were just saying that you just got done training a little bit ago then, right? Yep. I got home probably like 20 minutes ago, got in the shower and plopped down on the couch waiting for the call. <laughs> nice. So before we get into a little bit here, Corey, uh, what I wanted to talk about tonight, do you want to give a little bit of a background and who's Corey Anderson? I mean, a little bit different than some of my normal guests that are, you know, full fledged in, you know, say the hunting industry or, or hunters, you have a whole nother side of your life in MMA as well. Yeah. So, I mean, background on me, Corey Anderson is, uh, is now a UFC fighter, ranks in the top 10. I've uh, been doing the fight thing for five years, former college wrestling, small country town boy. You know, I grew up hunting with horses and dogs, goats, cows, and stuff like that. So, you know, hunting has always been a big part of me, but I've always was in athletics, you know, wrestled my whole life, played football my whole life, then um, took the wrestling path to college. And uh, that opened up other doors after college, and one of them happened to be MMA. Gave it a try, and uh, like I said, and uh, with the MMA being at the UFC platform, the biggest platform there is, is like the NFL of it. You know, when I got there, I've always been a hunter. You know, I started. It was not until probably three years after I had been in the UFC, I started actually posting pictures and stuff, hunting and shooting my bow, and that's when the attention got drawn from people that were fight fans. Some of them were fight fans and vegans, and some of them were fight fans. (laughs) You know, and the hunters caught my attention more than anything. Yeah. And, you know, just kind of put more and more and more into this hunting thing. So now it's kind of like, I feel like if I'm not fighting, I'm a full-time hunter because I'm learning so so much from so many people I've met in this journey. I'm spending most of my time in the woods, you know, just scouting and learning different things. Yeah. So when you, when you went to college for when you were wrestling and everything there, I I think you kind of touched on this a little bit, but did you, were you able to hunt it all then? Or did you kind of take a little bit of a step back from it? It was kind of like, like I said, I grew up my whole life. Hunting was hunting and fishing was always a weekend thing in my home. You know, we worked for my father's company. We did the chores. And if everything was done saturday morning like friday night he asked us you want to go fishing in the morning or if it's winter you want to go hunting in the morning you know me and my brother we loved it and so every saturday morning we try to get up load dogs up to go rabbit hunting uh, i didn't start deer hunting until like late in high school and i had friends that took me out my dad didn't do it that much but uh, now he also is a big hunter you know fishing and stuff like that but when you get to college and you get to sports it's hard to balance the school the sports the social life and be able to get home or get out and go hunting, you know? So yeah, I only hunted 
it through college, I can probably say a handful of times each school year because I'll only get to go home being a college wrestler on the starting lineup. You only get to go home Christmas Eve and Christmas morning. Thanksgiving Day, you have to be back at the gym the next day. And uh, New Year's and New Year's Eve. So yeah, those are the only days I'm home. And I'll try to make it out to the tree stand maybe once or twice just to see if I could see anything. But I usually didn't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's tough with only a few days. I mean, I remember in college, I was I was lucky enough to the – co- the college I went to, the university was – in kind of a, like a small town, like it was basically just a college town, but it was in the middle of a lot of farm country in Western Pennsylvania, just outside of Pittsburgh. And, uh, all of my roommates, uh, played football there. So they only had one night. It was Monday nights. They didn't have practice or anything. And that was the night, like everyone went out hunting and hopefully, you know, if we got a deer or anything, we'd come back and all skin it together and then get all everything and when it wasn't hunting season that was kind of our our dinner night to eat the deer meat and turkey and whatever else but but we were just lucky that we had like ground to be able to hunt around college there otherwise you know i like you said when you get so busy with with that especially with you and and wrestling it's it's uh tough to fit everything in in those years yeah i mean knowing what i know now about the good property or all you need is a small you can go to a two three acre lot you know for deer hunting if it's a good in a good spot you can find a deer knowing what i know now and the times to get in early i can get in early and get to class you know i didn't know that much about it in college but knowing that all three of the colleges i went to were kind of like country areas you know small schools one was in illinois down in like in the smack middle of corn farms and bean fields and stuff everywhere so i could i had classmates that parents owned the farm so i could have talked to them and just get out in the morning or um in south carolina the same thing one of my coaches lived on farmland he hunted a lot and then in whitewater which is my senior year in wisconsin i actually did hunt a little bit during the school year like that because the other team captain was a huge hunter and his family owned like 200 acres, like 45 minutes from the school. So if we didn't have a match or anything on the weekend or sometimes the starters didn't wrestle that weekend, he gave us the weekend off. We would go up to his family farm and hunt that, do like a little weekend deer camp team, brown them and down them. If we seen it, we were shooting. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, uh, yeah it was, that's awesome. Know, like I said, after that, I kind of just ran with it and I stayed and I ran with it, but I continued to hunt with their own. Yeah. And then, so how did you get into the whole fighting game? Was it kind of a natural, um, like next move or was it something that, that, uh, came kind of unexpectedly? No, it came completely unexpectedly. My, um, my coach, my senior year, one of my coaches, my senior year was Ben Askren. And at the time he was the 170, the middleweight Bellator champ. Or welterweight Bellator champ, excuse me. And uh, he also is an Olympian. And I, after college, I took second in the country. And I wanted to go into Olympic, the Olympic wrestling. He was working with me a little bit. And then one day he sent me an address to meet him at this different gym. And it happened to be an MMA gym. And uh, I didn't try it the first day. But the next day I came back, you know, just figured I should give it a try. I tried this opportunity out. And that was it. I've never wrestled again. I coached wrestling, but I've never competed at the wrestling level again. Yeah. And I'm sure that's played a, a big role in your success with MMA and now, you know, into the, the you know, the ultimate stage of it being the, the UFC. Uh, it seems like uh, the wrestlers always do really well in that stage. They have like that really strong wrestling background. Yeah, 100%. Because even if, you got really good hands or really bad hands, and you can use your wrestling at any point. I can rock a guy, and I just can't put him away with my hands. I can use the wrestling and take him to the ground and finish him on the ground. Or I could be pretty horrible with my hands and be getting beat up. And at any time, just time. If I know keep my hands up and time this guy's step, I can grab his leg and pull him to the mat and take him into my world. And it's a whole different story. Yep. Yeah, that's true. Yep, that's uh, that's 100% true. And, and uh, I've... I've watched a few of your fights and they're pretty impressive. It seems like that you've got kind of, you figured out the hand game there too. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, I mean, let's see, that was 2012 when I graduated college. I didn't have my first fight until 
2013, and I was in the UFC by the beginning of 2014. So you got to think I've kind of learned in this game, grew in this game, and learned everything fast on the fly. So starting off those first couple fights, I had to use the wrestling to, you know, just to get the victory, you know, avoid getting punched, get the guy down, hold him down, beat him up on the ground a little bit, score points there. If I get the finish, get the finish. And now I'm at the point now I've been training five years consistently, day in and day out, working a little bit of everything, kicks, punches, wrestling, jujitsu, you know, go straight to the boxing gym and just do straight boxing. And eventually you just start to develop that confidence in your hands to go ahead and wing them, just let them go. And then you go into the cage and you have that confidence that I can pretty much do just about everything. I might not be the greatest at it, but I'm I'm capable of handling wherever the fight go. If it's a striking fight, I can strike. If it's a kick fight, I can kick. If it's a wrestling fight, I'm a wrestle. And if it goes to the mat, I have jujitsu, good enough jujitsu where I know I'm not gonna get submitted and I can capitalize on certain positions. Yeah. And so that that was one thing that that I've kind of and, you know, I've, I've only met you once, but uh, when I talked to you the first time when a, a mutual friend of ours, Rob Chalinski, you know, introduced us together there and you came and you were talking to me about like, you know, your passion for hunting and everything else. And you could tell that your work ethic, like you're going to succeed in the hunting industry if you want to, as you have in, you know, wrestling and MMA. I mean, what... Did you, was the, your work ethic, did you get that from, you know, like say your father or family member, or was that something that you just had inside you just to work your ass off or whatever you wanted? I got it from my father. I mean, my father instilled it in his growing up and I didn't have it growing up and it was to my later years and I got older and, and I kind of, I started to remember the things my father told me and I was mature, more mature as a man that the thing started to make sense. And I put all the things that he said into play, you know, made it happen the way he used to tell me to, or do the things he used to tell me to try or do. And as an adult, it made sense and started, it was, it was making for more successful moves in my life than more downfalls, you know? So, and then I just continued to work hard and I still go home and talk to my dad to this day and pick his brain, ask him certain questions in certain situations. And he's always motivating me in a way to do things the smartest, not just the smartest way, but the best way and the most successful way as he would see it. And him being a successful businessman, I look up to him in different ways like that, that um, if it works for my father, it should definitely work for me. Yeah. And, and I think there's something to be said too, with if you want something bad enough, it's, it's one thing to want it bad enough. And it's another thing to, you know, put your effort behind it and work towards it. Cause I, I don't know. I'm under the belief that if you work at something hard enough, long enough that you'll succeed in it. Yeah. You might have some downfalls and failures along the way, but I, I feel like if you don't give up, it's just, it sounds cliche, but I truly believe it. You, you hear anybody that's successful, whether it's yourself or anyone else that is that they always have that kind of never quit attitude. Yeah, I mean, they people call it cliche, but I call it truth. It's 100 percent true. I mean, if I sit in the garage and work on my jab, I wanted to learn how to box, and I had to watch a YouTube video and realize, like, okay, you throw the jab this way. But it's not just going to come to me from watching the video. I have to go to the garage or in the in the mirror in the bathroom or wherever I'm at and just practice that simple movement over and over and over. And if I really want to do it, I'm gonna get up the next day and continue to do it. If I don't, I'm just going to say, ah, whatever, I did it that one time. It is what it is. I'll watch the next video and try to move on. But the people that really want to do something that's really good at something is because they formed habit doing it. As my coach used to say, we're going to farm habit and drill 80% of practice. And after the practice, I want you to pick one move and do it like 75 to 100 times. And if you really want to be good at it, you're going to dedicate your time full time, not just half ass in that move you're going to dedicate every rep to be as good as you can and before you know it you'll have it mastered you know and that i mean that directly correlates over to archery and like so right now i've been archery hunting my whole life since i was 12 years old and you know i've you know i was taught to you know i felt like i was a good shot my whole life but i'd hit these times that like I, i don't know if Corey, if you're familiar with the term target panic you know, like where you yep. just, you just struggle and you can't get the pin on. And, and I went through that a bunch of times in my life and I just kind of, you know, was able to get past it in a way that wasn't, you know, 
say probably the right way to, to break it down. Well, this year I just developed it extremely bad. I didn't shoot all winter like I normally do. And I just was struggling with it. So right now I'm back. I went back to ground zero. I you know, watched, started watching YouTube videos, John Dudley and everything else and talking to a bunch of other people that, you know, I'm reaching out to people to, you know, start over again with form and you know, all I've been doing like tonight, I just did probably 75 shots, just one arrow at a time at six feet. I'm just practicing going through my form, my release. I'm not worried about the site, nothing, just starting over. And I realized that I, I have to dedicate all my time to it. And yeah, that sucks that I might not be able to, you know, go to a 3d event and, and, you know, a few weeks or shoot the total archery challenge that I'm going to be at because I need to stay disciplined and, you know, and, and be ready when it comes hunting season. Yep. I mean, a hundred percent. I've did it myself. You know, I shoot daily. I have a 65 yard range in my yard and then, um, the bow shop is near the gym. So I always have, I have three bows. But I always have one on my backseat. I usually got my PSC because I got like a little partnership going with them. So I keep that in the backseat of my truck or my car, whatever vehicle I'm driving. If I'm at the gym or get out the gym early and I know the archery shop ain't nothing but 10, 10, 15 minutes away from wherever I am, I go over there, shoot for a half an hour, and then go to the next one. I shoot for a half an hour and get home. Or I come home from gym and pop the bed of my truck down, bag up and Put my speaker on and get my shots. Same thing. Try to get 30 to 40 shots. I'm just working on a simple form. Right now, I'm shooting at 60, 50 and 60 yards. I know my it ain't going to be bullseye every time, but I figure if I can get a good group going eventually at 50 and 60, next year at 20 and 30, it's going to be cakewalk just to take anything. Yep. Yep. No, that's, that's, that's right. When I started shooting long distances uh, a few years ago when I started going out west to hunt, it made my whitetail shots so much easier. Yeah, I mean, there's still other things that come into play with it that can screw it up. But as far as it, I felt so much more confident, you know, it shooting at longer ranges. And then you come in, like I said, then you have that whitetail comes by at 22 yards. It's like there's no question in your mind that arrow is going to hit where you want it to go. And mm-hmm. I, I, watched your, uh, I watched your YouTube video the other day. That you did doing the techno hunt at, at Joe Rogan's place. That's you seem to be shooting pretty well there, and I'm sure that was kind of uh, a little bit stressful. <laughs> I mean, it's like I told I've been doing this. Well, I started shooting at 12. I started with 3D shooting at 12, and let's see, the last two years I've been in Jersey, like it's been crazy. Like my wife, she even said that she was like, "Where was this when we first got together?" You know, I didn't have the balance of. Shoot, I only shot when I went back to Illinois, but I ended up getting the Matthews here and just started, got my first target and was shooting pretty much every day then. And now I just shoot, shoot, shoot. And when I went out there, and they're like, oh, you're going to be nervous. You're shooting with Joe Rogan. I'm like, no, I, it's muscle memory. Yeah. I've been doing it so long. You know? I take the first shot. I'm going to adjust my pin since I had to travel with the bow, probably vibrate a little bit. Once I get on, I'm going to be on. And every shot after that was either bullseye or vitals on the techno hunt and even joe said like Corey can shoot I'm like yeah i mean i put the time in and i want to be good i want to be like cameron haynes and john john Dudley making those shots at 100 yards like cakewalk you know like it's not don't even have to think about it just pull my bow back and let it fly yeah i want to be like that one day and so i just kind of i'm putting my reps in anytime i can i can go from the gym if i have to come home and watch the kid for a little bit watch my newborn as soon as my wife get back, if I have 10 to 15 minutes before I have to get to the gym, I go out there and get at least five to seven minutes of shooting in. Shoot a couple, run and grab the L, shoot another few, load up, and get out of here. But I have to get my reps daily. I would like to at least. Yeah. No, I, I agree with that. Like you said, you just once it gets to muscle memory, it makes it you know that much that much easier. And and last year, I, I, I was shooting probably the best that I'd ever had in it. I think it was because, you know, I, sh- I w- worked in an archery shop at the time. I shot every day after I'd work my nine to five, go to the archery shop till seven. And then I'd just sit back in the range after it closed from seven to nine and just, just throw arrows, you know, down range and just keep practicing, keep practicing. And then when it came times for events or, or any type of shoots and, you know, I was around people, I didn't feel that stress that that you know i normally would have if i was only 
you know, shooting a couple days a week or whatever else, you know, it might be. So that's, that's uh, w- one thing though, when talking about that techno hunt there, that looked like that was a pretty badass setup that he had there. Was that in his yeah. studio? Yeah, it was right outside. So it was inside of his big warehouse. And then he had the studio. He had everything in there. Studio in there. That, the techno hunt. And then on the other side, he just had like targets up in blocks. So from, I think it was probably from like 20 to probably, I would say 70, 80 yards. It's a huge warehouse. He got the weight room. He got the heavy bag. He got the jujitsu mat. Like he had everything he would ever need, like a clubhouse. So, yeah, that's that's pretty awesome. And if for anyone listening that doesn't know exactly what we're talking about, Corey was recently on Joe Rogan's podcast, and I would highly recommend that everyone listen to that as well. And is you dive a lot more into your MMA, um, you know, lifestyle as far and just your whole background. I mean, it was it was a very very good podcast. I enjoyed listening to it. Well, thank you. Yeah, yeah, no problem. And so, Corey, again, like I was I kind of jump back to when you know i met you in harrisburg there and you and again i could tell like you know in your voice that you were extremely passionate about hunting and you know and you you started a a youtube channel and everything else and wanting to show everyone you know that side of you everyone sees the fighting side on tv and everything but showing your passion of what you grew up doing hunting what was your you know reason for wanting to start a youtube channel what's kind of like your goals with it you know, originally when I, I bought a camera, I just wanted to film my hunts. You know, it'd be cool to look back and see them. You see them on YouTube and you see them on TV. And I was you know what? I just want to film my hunts. So I reached out to somebody to ask if they were selling, like on Facebook, anybody selling any used GoPros or whatever, I would like to purchase them because I'm going to use them to record my hunts. And I guess having a platform, I should expect it. It would have went out to just more than the general public and actually like, producer people people like that i had yeah, that i had met on the ultimate fighter that did the filming for that they're freelance filmers they contacted me like Corey, i'm telling you i didn't i didn't film for hunting shows and everything and i'm telling you right now if you did your own hunting show you could blow up and he's like not only is the fact that you're a ufc fighter a top ufc fighter but you're an african-american top ufc fighter there's not many African Americans in the hunting industry that does their own TV show. But the fact that you can tell that you're very passionate about it and you balance it between hunting and fighting, if you did it on your free time, man, you can make a killing with it. And you know, at the time I kind of thought nothing about it. I told you I was going to try it for a little bit. I tried to record, but it was just so, you know, like you said, if you really want to do something, you want to be good at it, you're going to dedicate your time to it. Or whatever. So I didn't dedicate my time to studying how you should be filming and setting up and the angles to catch and whatnot. And I was failing on remembering to turn the camera on or having to attack the camera on my bow and forget to turn it on. <laughs> or I turn it on and it on and it shut off when I go to shoot. It was just so many things. It was just I only had like one. I had two shots on camera. One was kind of you couldn't tell because after I shot, I dropped the bow right away. And the other one, I actually put it on my YouTube channel. I had the tactic cam facing the deer and the GoPro facing me, but the sound on the GoPro was horrible, so you can't hear me talking and everything. So like that's all just part of the things I'm learning. So now I end up getting a, a research what's a good, decent camera, a cheap beginner camera to get if you can record. I met with the tactic cam guy at the Great American Outdoor Show when I met you, so he gave me a camera. Uh, talked to you and talked to other people that gave me ideas on how to do it. So now I have a Canon G20. I have the mic. I got the wireless remote. So if I'm out there by myself, I got the tree stand set up with the um, cable remote that hooks to the end of it for if one of my teammates or buddies come out and film me. You know, I got all the stuff that's needed. And I go out to the trees now and practice setting up and visualize what tree I would go on and get the, the clearest view where I'll be brushed in. You know, I've been doing all my research to see what how do these guys do it successfully where they can have the camera ready to go when a deer walks in that's going to walk in the picture and not walk out before the shot and learning where the deer going to be, you know, it's just like everything. You got to study, do your homework. And now that I spent that time doing it in the off season as I am now and going out and scouting and playing with the camera. And I'm learning a lot more about the camera, the tripods, the, the scorpion tails, the different things I have to carry it, maneuver it, 
how to get in and out of the woods the fastest and the smoothest without making noise with the tripod if I'm hunting in the blind. I did that in turkey season. You know, and I got a couple turkey hunts in with the camera. So, again, I'm just putting it all together. And now I feel like going into this year, I'll be ready to actually get good hunting footage. But then at the same way, like you said, how did I get started? And you're not going to hunt all year round. I just figured instead of just doing hunting, we're just going to do everything outdoors. I'm outdoors all the time. Let's just film it. Let everybody see me from a different side, different light. You know, they see me in the cage, they see me in the gym, but you don't see me at home with my dog and my kid and in the woods every day. So let's give them it. Yeah. No, I think that's, I, like I said, I thought it was an awesome idea to be able to do that. And that, that truly gives, you know, whether it's even your, your UFC fans or people that are into hunting, like you said, a whole different perspective on you and kind of get to see that. And it makes them feel, you know, uh, almost a part of the journey with you being able to follow along through all those different steps. I think it's a pretty awesome idea. I'm excited to see what kind of things you come up with, you know, especially this year. I think it, you know, it could be a, a breakthrough, you know, year for you with it, with I'm sure a lot of learning as, as you know, you continue to learn with it and as we all do. Yeah. I mean, like I said, it was just the, I really like, I wanted to get the hunting stuff out there, but, now I'm starting to see the best part about it. Like I said, see me in a different light and realize I'm just a normal guy. You know, I was at somewhere today, or at the bow shop actually, getting my buddy set up with a bow and whatnot. And the guy, my buddy Michael, owned the shop. He's like, oh, you fighters, you're making big money. you too fancy. Yeah, I keep telling like, you got me wrong, man. Like, if you see my channel, you'll see everything is pretty simple. I'm, I do all the editing myself, and I'm learning. Everything I'm doing, I'm learning it for the first time. I'm learning how to use Premiere Pro. I'm learning how to upload videos the best and fastest way, how to not take up too much room on my computer, how to make things move faster, how to unpixelate, you know? So I'm, I enjoy learning different things because, like my father always told me, anything you learn, it's yours. It's stuck between your ears for the rest of your life. So I might not use this ever again, or maybe one day I can get offered a job in the hunting industry where I start off filming or some shit like Lake Pickle did with Primo. He started off, and then he's a filmer, and then he get to hunt. Stuff like that. So who knows? If I'm prepared and the opportunity to come, I'll be ready to take it. Yeah, I, I can I can totally relate to that. I mean, when I decided I wanted to start a podcast, you know, I, I had the idea a few years ago and it took me until last year to really, you know, go all in and say I was going to do it. I had no idea how to edit audio. I had no idea what I needed to record. No idea how to make a logo for my company, how to start a company, do all that stuff. I just you know, just put my nose to the grindstone, watch YouTube videos to learn trial and error, just kept going back and forth. And it's really, it, uh, it's really satisfying when you teach yourself those type of things. And, and then also it's awesome when you reach out to people that can help you out and everything else along the way. It's just, it's just, it's cool to, to be able to do that again. It's just satisfying from that standpoint, you know, a hundred percent. Like I said, that way, I think the, Coolest part so far for me was, uh, like you see on like the TV, the outdoor channels, and they, they have the camera facing the people talking, and they flip back to the deer coming in, and they flip back to the person as they grab the bow and they start setting up to pull back. All of a sudden, a little picture will pop up of the deer, or the screen will turn big on the deer, and it'd be a little picture of the person. I always enjoy that. Like, that's dope. I can see the deer moving and what the guy is doing. I think the dopest thing I did on the video where I posted the hunt from last year, I actually figured out how to do the picture in picture <laughs> and I'm in it to exactly the point. Once my bow locked out, the camera switched around, but you saw me still holding the bow and you see the deer move in and I was able to highlight the deer in the camera. You can see it moving. And like, I was, I was excited. Like I bragged to my wife about for like two, three, three, four days about how like, babe, did you believe that? I did that. I got the picture in picture. <laughs> and then we watched Sunday. I watched hunting channel all Sunday night. And when one to come on and somebody do like, hey, babe, babe, remember? I did that about video. And she's like, oh, my God, you're such a dork. <laughs> but to me, that's like dope because I've seen that stuff all my life and wondered, like, man, how do they do that? And now I can do that myself. Yeah. That's just, you know. <laughs> that's awesome. What what kind of plans do you have uh, this year? Do you have any special hunts? Do you plan on hunting, you know, in New Jersey, back in your home in Illinois? Or what do you got planned for this year? 
I got all kinds of hunts I got I want to do. Um, so far, planned, I'm going to Montana for my first elk hunt for my birthday, September around September 22nd or whatever. Um, I got my father has land in Kentucky. I'm gonna try to get down there hunt that. Um, I work with this veterans program in Texas, Hero Sports. So I'm gonna try to make it out there and do some hunts with them. Right now, they've been inviting me out all the time because, you know, they hunt exotics year-round, hogs and predators. So every weekend, they're hunting. But like I said, I had a newborn. Or two months ago, I had my child. So it's hard to get away now. So like I said, I'm putting all my time now and getting everything done. So when hunting season comes around, I won't be hindered to at least a quick weekend trip, jump on a plane Friday morning, hunt Friday night, Saturday, Sunday morning, and get back in time to be with my family through the week. But, uh... Yeah, I definitely want to do the elk hunt. I want to. I'm going to Saskatchewan with my buddy Sean Legal and his outdoor fitter. I went black bear hunting with him last year. This year he's gonna take me whitetail hunting. He sent me some pictures of some big ones he's gotten out of there. Um, I was gonna go to Vegas and do the muleys, but I decided to just pass on that. I didn't want to spend any more money on the tag that I might not get to even go out there and try. Yeah, um, Scotty. <laughs> Some pack to cam inviting me out to Iowa for muzzleload season. Um, at his place, and you know, a lot of people, T Bone Turner from Bone Collectors invited me out to Georgia. Levi Morgan invited me down to PA to do some doe hunting or whatever, helping with the doe population and stuff like that. Like I said, being in the industry and with the name I have been in fighting, it's easy to get my to get in contact with these guys and. And if they're fans of mine, which it seem to be a lot of them are, it's it's cool to get out there and hunt with them if I can make it happen. Yeah, that's that's pretty awesome. I, I think um, I'm excited for you to get to experience elk hunting. I'm telling you what, when you experience bugling bulls during the rut like that, you're going to be hooked, man. I, I just, that's, I love it. It's bread and butter. I love elk hunting. Like, yeah, I think you're going to have a blast doing that. No, that's not a guy that's taking me. I just want to hear one bugle. Ain't that what they say? They hear elk's bugle or when they start grunting or whatever it is? Yeah, yeah. They I want to hear Start bugling, yep. Yeah, you hear it on TV. You see it on TV and YouTube, but I've never heard it in person. You say, they say oh, you can hear it from like a mile away. Well, I just want to hear it. I want to be in the area and hear it. That would be worth the hunt itself. Hey, and if you don't, just come – Come up to uh, visit me in north central Pennsylvania, not too far from you. We got an elk herd here that's awesome. You can't draw on a tag is pretty much um, close to impossible as it gets, but it's so fun to go. I'll go out and just bugle and uh, listen for bulls, and it's just such an awesome experience just to hear them, like you said, in person. So just keep that under your hat. You ever want to check out Pennsylvania elk country, it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's just, like I said, if I don't shoot one, I just want to hear one. That'll probably get my blood and my the hairs on my arm standing up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It. The, I remember the first time I heard one in Colorado, and it was like we went, drove the whole way out there, you know, 27 hours out and get there. And the first night in, bugled down to this canyon, and one responded back to us. And it was like, like I can't believe it. Like, just, just you know, you couldn't wipe the smile off my face at that point. It's it's really that's cool. Like, that was kind of like me turkey hunting this week. Last week I was. Yeah, it was my second week ever turkey hunting. You know, I never touched a box call. I never even touched a turkey call at all. So the first week I was out, it was kind of like just figuring out what the hell I'm doing. There was no way I was getting anything to call back. But uh, the last, what, Thursday? Yeah, last Thursday I went out. I had bought a, um, a gobble, the shake gobble. And the guy at the bow shop let me use his box call. And I had figured out the slate. I practiced the slate and the mouth call all week. So I hit the yelp on the slate. He heard something in the distance. You know, I couldn't get a good sound of it. So I went to the mouth call and started yelping back or cutting one of it. So I can't remember what I was doing. And it just got silent. And like after 30 minutes, I grabbed the shake gobble. I'm like, let me hit this. And as I started to shake it, like right behind my blind here, two of them started gobbling back. And all of a sudden they came around the corner. Like, oh, snap. I finally, I called one in. I yeah. heard him gobble. I didn't have it. So to me, that was like I told people. Grant, I didn't kill nothing. I got some in, you know. So that's hey, that's a that's tough to do in its own, especially your you know first time really getting into turkey hunting and learning how to call and stuff. That's a a feat in its own. And um, 
with I, I saw I was watching on your Instagram stories as you were going through that process of learning how to call and and I think that's an awesome way that you're sharing that too, like showing look, I'm learning, you know, as I go and you're kind of showing everybody the process of starting something new and working at it until you end up succeeding. Mm-hmm. Like I guess I have my mouth caught in the uh cup holder of my truck. And every day heading to the gym or hey, wherever I would go, I'll pop it in my mouth and just start doing calls. And I'll turn the radio down and it's dog, 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 dog. And the, <laughs> chick, 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 and making it trying to get that perfect tone and then find the perfect rhythm. And, you know, then if I felt good, I recorded like hey, is it good? And I put the little pole up, yes or no. <laughs> you know, I went from ninety no's to two yeses to the last time it was like hundred and twenty people saying yes. I had Lake Pickle contact him and say, bro, I will hunt with that tomorrow. That will get somebody's attention. T-Bone Turner saying, that's it. And I only had like eight or nine no's. It's like, man, that's a big change I made within a week. You know, just constantly practicing in my free time. My wife hated it. She got very annoyed. But <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> I was about to be in the woods just sitting out there not knowing what I was doing. I had to practice sometimes. Yeah, no, I I hear you. I I always do that in a, the the truck too, and I'm driving back and forth between places. Always keep a mouth call in, and that's you know that's always fun. I I think when I was learning how to bugle for elk, I think my neighbors hated me because I'd go right outside on my deck and just bugle off the side. And at the time, I lived down towards Pittsburgh, and I had some neighbors, and yeah, I don't think they were a huge fan of the elk bugling next door. But hey, I had to practice. <laughs> Yeah, that was like with the box call. I was sitting in the yard because I live the woods behind my house. So I would go out there and try to yelp or gobble or cr- uh, um, cackle and see if I get anything in the woods to <laughs> start making noise. But <laughs> dark or early in the morning. So I know if the nervous neighbors heard it, they weren't enjoying it. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. <fine. laughs> uh, bless you. <laughs> Thank you. But, um, yeah, that's, that's funny, man. I, I, uh, like I said, I applaud you for showing, like I said, the, even when you were struggling with it, just beginning to the portion where you, you know, you had it, you know, figured out and that's, that's always a, a cool process. And that's, you know, a point I'd always try to get across, like with, you know, with my podcast here, a lot of it is surrounded by trying to help people you know, go on ad- adventure style hunts and adventure could be anything. It could be going to the Rocky mountains, hunt elk, or it could be hunting in your backyard. If something's new to you and it's challenging and it, it's really pushing your limits, you know, that's an adventure and it's just, you just got to put the work in for it, man, you know? And that's, I, th- again, that's what, that's what I saw. Like when I started following your stuff and everything from the, the hunting side of things and just, seeing the the work you're putting in i'm like i i want to talk to this guy on the podcast but yeah so that's um sounds like you got a pretty pretty busy schedule coming up for this year are you gonna do or do you have any fights planned for this year i'm trying to get one now you know i like to get them i try to base them in between like the important hunting seasons but it, I doubt it happens half time, especially because the last few weeks of fight camp, I don't. I lock my bow in my case and put it in the basement. It's kind of like my my focus point, all right? Because I have to be 100% dedicated to just this fight camp now. Studying film, eating right, going to bed at the right time. If I'm always shooting, I'll be at the gym or at the archery range late or in the yard late, and then get in to eat dinner late, then do my recovery stuff late. I end up in bed late, and everything is thrown off for the next day. So like the last three four weeks, I kind of lock it away and don't touch it till after the fight. So I like to try to base my fights like before hunting season. And then like another one, like around Christmas time or December after the rut, you know, so I can hunt the hunt the rut and hunt the early season and stock up on my meat for that as well. But right now I'm just flailing the wind, waiting to see what's going to happen. Are you, uh, are you looking for a certain, competitor that you're wanting to go against or a certain caliber to just keep kind of pushing your boundaries or uh are you looking to take it any fight at this point to to stay with it no i only want a top fight a good fight one of the top guys i've been fighting the top 15 and top 10 my whole career all last year i fought top 10 and top five one top 10 and two top five guys and 
<laughs> I beat them all. So in my mind, there's no reason to take a step back. Right now, I want Dominic Reyes, who they jumped in front of me at five. And, you know, after him, I, I won the title fight originally. I, I did everything I was supposed to do that I think I deserve the title fight, but they expect me to do more. So I'm not going to do anything that's going to set me back. I'm only going to do things that's pushing me forward. So top five, top three, get me to the title fight as soon as I can because I deserved it and I'm ready for it. Yeah. I um. So that, that was something I never really understood with the UFC is how they – choose sometimes uh the people that would go to the title fight and some that i i used to follow really closely and i just sometimes it was like why why aren't they giving this guy a shot you know like it, i don't know it just seemed like a, a weird system to me it used to be you beat the right person you get the opportunity like if you beat the number one number two guy you're next in line if you beat the number three guy you take the third spot but now it's kind of i feel it's more Who's going to sell the most tickets? Who do people want to see? You know, oh, that guy's exciting. He's ranked 12th, but he's exciting. So we're going to give him the title fight. You know, it's it's not right, but it is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, those things are out of your control at that standpoint. So just got to keep keep working out until you get that chance, I guess, right? Yep. Yep. So do you, do you think that that's in store in the next couple of years? I mean, do you see that happening? I mean, this year, before this year is the plan. You know, next couple of years, I'm right there. I've been knocking on the door the last three fights. You know, the, the two guys I beat prior was next in line for the title fight if they beat me. So I don't see why I haven't gotten it yet. But I'm just going to keep working and stay ready. And eventually they can't deny me. And they got to give me what I've earned. Yeah. I mean, you're in one of the most in my opinion, challenging divisions in the UFC too with the light heavyweight. There's a lot of and in all of them there's a lot of really great fighters, but man, that that division always seems stacked. Yeah, probably people say it's not stacked because it's a small division, but the thing they don't realize is any at any day anybody in that division can knock anybody out. You know, because it's the big guys are fast. Like um my first loss was to a guy who's not even in top fifteen now. You know, but if I fought him again, it is possible that he could possibly knock me out again because it's we just hit so hard. It only takes a small mistake. You know, at any given day, if everybody in this division have that punch's chance because we're so big, we're so powerful. It only takes one to land. If I land one, that could be it. You know, it might not happen. Nine times out of ten, it doesn't happen. But that one time, if it does, hey, that's off to you. Now you're the you're the best or you're the, the champ or whoever it is you beat. And it's just, you know, so. Yeah. Well, hopefully you get that opportunity. Like I said, if anyone, you know, follows along with your stuff or sees it, definitely, you know, putting in the work. And I'm sure there's a lot that's, you know, not on camera, not that, you know, that people don't see that the dedication that you're putting towards it. So hopefully you get that chance, man. I uh, hope so too. Thank you. Yeah. So, Corey, is there anything else that you wanted to cover, whether it's from MMA to hunting or anything else that you want to kind of leave with some last words here? I don't think we covered just about everything. Yeah. All right. Well, where can where can people find some more information? Give me give me some stuff with your YouTube channel and your Instagram and everything else where you're putting out some stuff where people can find some of your outdoor adventures and, and some of your lifestyle stuff, too. All right, well, you can first say, can all follow me on Instagram at C-O-R-E-Y-A underscore M-M-A. That's Corey A underscore M-M-A. On there, you will find a link in my bio to my YouTube channel, and you'll see a lot of posts coming from the YouTube channel. You go to my story. I'm always attaching links to it. Uh, different podcasts I do, like the Joe Rogan is on there somewhere. Uh, you can follow my or subscribe to the YouTube channel or check it out on YouTube under Outdoors with Overtime. You know, again, that's Outdoors with Overtime, my fight name. And um, you can find me on Facebook and Twitter. Twitter is also Corey A underscore MMA. And Facebook is just Corey Anderson. You see a picture of me in a red suit with my wife in a black dress, you know. So, uh, so on each platform, everything I post, I try to post on every platform so all my fans and every following get a taste and get to know what's going on. 
Awesome, man. Well, hey, thanks for again carving some time out to be able to talk to me here, and and hopefully uh, I get to you know check it out and everyone gets to see your your hunts this year unfold and and then end the year hopefully after the rut that you get that title fight. I both think I'm going to do everything I can to get it filmed correctly and edit it perfectly so that people can get the whole experience like I have. <laughs> Sounds good, man. We'll talk to you soon. All right, Bo. Have a good one. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit eastmeetswesthunt.com, Facebook at East Meets West Outdoors, and Instagram at East Meets West Hunt. If you enjoyed today's episode, please review and subscribe, and we'll catch you next time.